his motion. You have the floor, sir. Thank you, Honorable Speaker, sir. Mr. Speaker, sir, I move that the Parliament debates the Reserve Bank of Fiji Insurance 2017 Annual Report, which was tabled on 4th April 2019. Is there a seconder? Honorable Speaker, say I second the motion. I now invite the chairperson of the Standing Committee on Economic Affairs to speak on the motion. You have the floor, sir. Thank you, Honorable Speaker, sir. The Standing Committee on Economic Affairs table its review of the 2017 annual report of Fiji Insurance Annual Report on 4th April 2019. For the year 2017, the theme was inclusive insurance as a way to focus the effort of various industry stakeholders to increase penetration into the communities for increased update on insurance. In this regard, various aspects of were explored while deliberating on the insurance report, one of which was to focus the small medium enterprises. Other issues that the committee discussed was the alarming rate of insurance being surrendered and lapsed due to inability to continue payment, which effectively is a direct loss of saving for people. The committee welcomed the Fijian government's initiative of bundle insurance, which initially covered sugarcane farmers and is now extended to rice farmers, dairy farmers, corporate farmers, social welfare recipient, and all civil servants. For the information of the honorable member, members, the committee has tabled its RBF insurance 2018 annual report this morning. This report will, will be covering the latest development since the 27, 2017 annual report. The committee also noted the RBF has taken initiative to be more gender inclusive. This was done through collaborating disgraded data from all licensed financial institutions, including insurance companies, in order to better understand and design products and services that were suitable for the financial need of Fiji and women. The committee was satisfied with the overall performance of Reserve Bank of Fiji as the, as the regulator of the insurance industry. I take the opportunity to thank the hardworking RBF governor and his team Mr. Speaker said, with those few comments to enlighten this House as, the mover, as a member moving this motion, I thank you for this opportunity. I thank the Chairperson. Honorable members, the floor is now open for debate on this motion. Honorable Thank you, uh, Honourable uh, Speaker. I'd like to contribute to the debates and the um, reports on the RBF insur annual report for the RBF uh, for 2017. For 2017, thank you, Honourable Speaker. <clears throat> insurance. If there is anything that we can consider as vitally important in this day and age of climate change and COVID-19, I believe insurance would be very much at the top of all this. In terms of priority, insurance should, should be a subject that this House and the people of Fiji should regard as very, very important and urgent in the way we live in this country. Honorable Speaker, it is a known fact that the penetration for insurance in this country is very, very low. Uh, people don't seem to understand the importance of insurance, hence my initial statement that we need to take this very, very seriously and take leadership to motivate our people, even ensure that everyone in this country is insured. 
In general insurance, Honorable Speaker, the penetration is most uh, poor. This is in buildings, structures. Over the weekend, Honorable Speaker, there was this story by a woman in Vatulele over during, during the last cyclone, Cyclone Herald, where she said that the house was shaking. She knew that the house was going to collapse. So she ran with her daughter to the church to take shelter. That always fills me with horror, Honorable Speaker, when you remember some years back the case in Vambea, where people went to shelter in a church and it collapsed on them. Honorable Speaker, <clears throat> every village in Fiji has or should have a community hall. As you know, Honorable Speaker, it was the policies of the government of SVT and SDL to help the villagers build a community hall. Unfortunately, this has been removed with the Fiji First government. Honorable Speaker, in the deliberations with the insurance underwriters, they indicated that most of these community halls are not insurance compliant. That people are taking shelter in structures that are not safe. And I have raised this on a number of occasions in this parliament that we must strive to encourage our villagers and help them to bring their community hall up to, uh, up to standard so that they can qualify to be insured. Honorable Speaker, we must encourage the construction of community hall come uh, shelters in, in every village. We are now living in an age where climate change is a factor and cyclones are quite frequent. Already we've had two this year. Um, and not only in a Itauke village, in every settlement where you know that the structures are not that strong. I always remember a case when I was a hotelier, the wind was blowing. And one of my staff members, a young indo fijian boy, came to me and said, sir, can the company vehicle take me to my home? There's only my wife and my daughter in our house. And it was a lean-to kind of house, about 30 minutes away in the ABCC. And I had to make a very difficult decision. I looked at him and I knew what he was going through. But then it would have meant sending a company vehicle with a company driver and himself into an area that was, that was when danger was uh, developing. I could have lost a company vehicle, I could have lost the lives of two of my guys on the road. So I had to say, I'm sorry, I can do it. It, it was a very difficult decision. But, and I asked him, do you have families nearby where they can run to? And he said, no, I don't really have that. So really, in, in every settlement, wherever you have uh, squatters, we must strive to build a community hall for them, a shelter. It is now um, a known fact that climate change is going to affect uh, the weather in ways that will that will produce more cyclones. So it is, it is very important for us, Honorable Speaker, to, to make sure that every village has a community hall, every settlement has a community hall worthy of, of being a shelter during times of emergency. Um, I, will you, most of us live in very strong homes, and every, every time it happens, Honorable Speaker, I remember, I think of our people in those settlements and in the outer islands who shelter in, in very flimsy structures. Honorable Speaker, 
<coughs> insurance also relies a lot on reinsurance, meaning that a part of the premium you collect locally is sent overseas. This helps Honorable Speaker in spreading the risk for, for Fiji. And Fiji is very fortunate that reinsurers from overseas consider F Fiji um, positively at this time. But according to the underwriters, according to the uh, to the likes to the likes of uh, to the brokers, the Fiji is in danger of losing its cyclone cover internationally. And this honourable speaker is something that we should um, consider seriously. I remember in the days back 30 or 40 years ago, the hoteliers could not secure cyclone cover overseas. They just refused to, to cover Fiji for insurance because of the frequent cyclones. And the Reserve Bank had to set up a facility to enable the hotels to reinsure and enable them to, to carry their own insurance. That may have to come one day, Honorable Speaker, so we should be prepared for, prepared for it. And um, I would urge the government to, to start dialogue on this, together with the RBF, Honorable Speaker, and many companies in Fiji, Honorable Speaker, can take up the challenge. To be, to be, to, we can, we can start, start setting up insurance companies. If you look in this report, Honorable Speaker, it talks about Sun Insurance, a local company, and very successful. They do a very good job. So there are opportunities for other companies in Fiji to st start up uh, insurance companies. I think, I believe it, um, some time back, a group of uh, Ito K decided, wanted to set up an insurance company, but they, they, they could not get the help that, that they required. Honorable Speaker, insurance is a must thing, and especially in today's, uh, in today's uh, conditions. Uh, I was quite touched by the uh, maiden speech today about Honorable Choir, that this is a generation of COVID-19. Lots of things you have to do differently. You now the challenge is there, that we have to rise up to the challenge. And one of it, Honorable Speaker, is to relook at the insurance issue. In the report that was tabled this morning by our chair, Honorable Vijay Nath, he talked about making car insurance compulsory. We may have to come to that. We may have to make insurance compulsory in car insurance, in life insurance, and general insurance. We can no longer say that it's all private driven, it's all demand and supply driven. No, I think the time has come. Time has come. Now the climate change and COVID-19, that the leadership comes from, from us to say it must be compulsory for, compulsory for everyone. Honorable Speaker, that is my contribution on this, and I, again, uh, underline the, the message that insurance is so critical to us and we must, as leaders, embrace it totally so that everyone is protected from all eventualities. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. I thank the Honorable Speaker. Boy. Honorable Boyas Coyer, you have the floor. <clears throat> thank you, Honorable Speaker. Honorable Speaker, <clears throat> I... Um, I rise to contribute to the review report of the Standing Committee on Economic Affairs on the Reserve Bank of Fiji Insurance 2017 Annual Report. Our speaker, sir, it's actually quite uh, interesting to note that for the year 2017, the theme was inclusive insurance as a way to focus the efforts of various industry stakeholders. And I think it's quite applicable uh, in terms of the setting that we're actually in now. Honourable Speakers, I acknowledge the recommendations and I thank the committee uh, uh, and for reviewing the report. And it's actually pleasing to note that uh, the Fijian insurance industry, the total asset was about 1.7 billion in 2017, which has been an, uh, an increase of about 5.8% uh, from 2016, and that's quite impressive, sir. However, Honourable Speakers, it's also quite evident that the insurance industry needs to bridge uh, the, ins the insurance protection gap in somewhat uh, similar sentiments just being echoed by Honorable Gaboka with a focus, and I think the focus here needs to be offering innovative insurance solutions uh, by the private sector to the micro and small medium enterprises, which forms a major part of our economy. 
Mr. Speaker, sir, I'd like to applaud the RBF also uh, and the insurance agencies in their, effort, in their efforts to, uh, in developing insurance policies, policies to include products for MSMEs and, and the informal sector. It's actually much needed uh, in these days, Honorable um, Speaker, purely also because of the unpredictability of the events nowadays, you know, such as cyclone, uh, you know, climate change has led to this, and global out outbreaks as we are experiencing now. Um, Honorable Speaker, I also note the importance of um, tailor-made insurance policies that specifically target MSMEs, namely to provide financial support for uninsurable uh, risks and contribute towards MSME resilience. Mr. Speaker, so the recommendation one uh, states that proper research is required to ensure such policies would benefit all SMEs in, in various sectors. And uh, with respect to the, uh, the, the ministry, sir, um, it's in the process of establishing an MSME database to ensure that the availability of reliable data that will assist in formulating these particular insurance policies. Mr. Speaker, so with regards to recommendation four, uh, I'd like to commend the discussion on the establishing of, of working groups, um, such as the Agriculture Insurance National Working Group, uh, for discussion with respect to products in the agriculture uh, sector. And this initiative would be a game changer to the agriculture sector, uh, as it would be, it will really entice our youth um, to harness their entrepreneurial skills in agribusiness business and, and would attract more investments to agriculture. Honourable Speaker, so whilst the Fijian government has uh, initiated a bundle insurance for sugarcane farmers, and dairy farmers, and copra farmers, and rice farmers, this is probably a good time to urge the private sector, Honourable Speaker, to seriously remodel their business and, and offer insurance products in the natural resources space. To conclude, uh, Honourable Speaker, um, we are definitely, as I had said earlier this morning, so we're really in revolu revolutionary times uh, when, when the whole world is rethinking and remodeling and reposition, uh, repositioning itself. You know, we have to do that as a nation. And the insurance industry can actually play a crucial role um, in, and a critical role in rebooting the economy. And if they had uh, tailor-made products for these, for for the actual pandemic that we are facing. And for instance, and a great example is our cooperatives based in our rural areas. Uh, and they can play an essential role in linking these members to uh, insurance products such as life insurance, medical insurance, etc., uh, and, and also superannuation funds. Uh, Honorable Speaker, sir, I thank you for giving me the floor to contribute to the motion. I thank the Honorable Minister. I now give the floor to the Honorable Dr. Philippe Tuchelau, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, sir. I rise to contribute to the debate on the uh, 2017 uh, RDF insurance report. It's uh, critical that we, when discussing insurance, also share the uh, sentiments uh, from the experts, especially uh, when we did our work as the committee. And uh, which might not be too detailed in what you have in front of you. As uh, raised by Honorable uh, Minister, the um, SMEs insurance is a critical area. That's also uh, raised by the various uh, stakeholders. In particular, the small businesses. Uh, we have uh, received, uh, not only in the constituencies, but also as members, uh, concerns regarding uh, insurance for small SMEs in the tourism sector particularly those who are informal, maybe not, don't have land titles, etc., cetera, um, based on Matangali land, who uh, do not comply. So it sort of requires a relook by the uh, insurance providers at the, uh, with the co compliance requirements in order to include these, uh, these small uh, SMEs. Another area which was, uh, exp where concern was expressed was the delay in the um, review of the Insurance Act. And uh, the Insurance Act uh, 98 has been uh, identified as, uh, review has been identified as long overdue. And that is an area which uh, not only the providers, but also the regulators have identified as, uh, as critical. 
It has now been placed for nearly 20 years, and it needs uh, a review in terms of the provisions. And we are um, urging the government to facilitate uh, that. Uh, we have also um, received feedback on agriculture, introducing insurance products for agriculture, as mentioned by the minister. And we note uh, the Agriculture Insurance National Working Group has been established and uh, discussing, designing, and implementing an action plan for the provision of agriculture insurance. And they first met in December 2018. Again, that is something in progress which needs to be facilitated, facilitated and uh, driven to a conclusion to benefit the uh, agriculture sector. The other information I just wanted to share with the House was uh, from the um, regulators, that uh, government has become a member of the Pacific Catastrophe Risk Assessment and Financing Initiative, which is um, very, very useful for the Pacific, meaning Pacific uh, Catastrophe Risk Insurance Company can now offer sovereign paramedic insurance, so covering insurance uh, insurance covering specific events rather than uh, a general cover such as cyclones and uh, tsunamis eh? so that is um, a good development but again which needs to be um, progressed uh, we also uh, note from uh, rbf the pacific inclusion financial inclusion program who are working on a pacific regional climate risk adaptation and insurance pro project which is a parametric index micro insurance for households, uh, specifically targeting households and their specific insurance needs. So uh, I suppose the idea there is to ensure that insurance is also spread out across all sectors of the community, irrespective of uh, income or the compliance uh, requirements that need to be in place. Again, that is an area which uh, needs to be uh, pro progressed. Uh, Honorable Nabok and uh, Honorable Minister have mentioned uh, bundle insurance. That was uh, in association with the Fiji government, launched by Fiji Insurance in uh, Fiji Care Insurance Limited in June 2017, initially for sugarcane farmers. And uh, it includes term life, funeral expenses, fire, personal accident, eh, which is a very positive uh, development. And uh, in 2018, it was extended to rice, copra, dairy, social welfare recipients, and civil servants. Uh, we think, we suggest that it be uh, expanded to other, um, I suppose, producers such as Yangon and root crop farmers. And uh, we have already suggested that. And again, uh, I'm highlighting that to the government if that could be uh, progress. Uh, I've mentioned uh, catastrophic risk assessment. And um, from the, one of the presentations uh, we received, there was quite an interesting one from uh, an insurance, a medical insurance provider. And uh, some of the sentiments they mentioned, the difficulties they face in terms of uh, providing that kind of cover in uh, Fiji, in terms of um, the equipment needed, the investments they need to make. Eh? And um, one of the issues they mentioned is because of the um, high risk and high investment is the need to partner with government. Eh? And uh, government had made uh, an announcement on that and uh, we had uh, sort of uh, viewed that as a positive development with uh, ESPEN regarding the uh, Mbai and Lotok Hospital. So I was wondering, uh, where it is uh, today uh, regarding uh, the development and how that has uh, progressed. Maybe the Honorable uh, Minister of Economy would update us uh, later in the city. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. I thank the Honorable. I give the floor to the Honorable Bimin Prasad. You have the floor. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I I know you had difficulty identifying me at the back, but thank you for the opportunity. 
Uh, I'm going to make a very brief uh, contribution on this report. I want to thank the committee for uh, a very good set of recommendations. And uh, in particular, I would like to pick on recommendation eight, because this is an important recommendation and one that is going to deal with the effect uh, of the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic and the effect it is going to have on, on people uh, and the ability to actually keep up their premium uh, payment on time. I know there are many people uh, who hold insurance policies, Mr. Speaker, who are having a lot of difficulty, and I know insurance companies are providing ways and means for them to keep their uh, policy uh, alive. But there are also many who are giving up, and uh, as the committee um, rightly notes, you know, this is even before the onslaught of COVID-19, uh, that the the alarming rate of insurance being left due to inability to continue payment uh, would, would be made worse. So I, I think uh, what I would say to the government is to uh, look at uh, this issue uh, right now because we expect uh, the economy to uh, move towards a very, very serious decline for the next uh, two or three years, and we need to look at this group. And there are many um, Insurance um, policies or insurance industry, Mr. Speaker, is very important to our economy, but it also has a lot of intricacies. There are a lot of issues within the insurance industry with respect to how the policies are marketed, how people uh, get into buying policies and then realizing the benefits and the difficulty that they have in keeping up the, uh, the, the um, uh, policy uh, premiums. Uh, I also note that the committee has talked about the RBF, uh, so, sorry, the Insurance um, uh, Act, uh, 1998. Uh, this is an important uh, undertaking by the committee, and I hope that uh, perhaps uh, very soon, you know, maybe this is an opportune moment for us to actually look at the uh, Act uh, and, and look at what might be the situation in the next three or four, four years and in the future to deal with some of the issues uh, that might arise uh, out of the insurance industry. Uh, I think the public consultations uh, that um, is being planned, uh, or I'm not sure whether it's already been done, uh, Mr. Speaker, but I think we need to carefully look at what are the concerns of the people, because I know that there are uh, medical insurance policies where a lot of people have difficulty where a lot of people find uh, that the product which they bought or they, they took the policy on uh, is not delivering uh, to the extent or the, to the expectation of the people who bought policies. And, and I think we need to look at some of those issues while we are reviewing the Act so that this can uh, be brought together uh, as part of the uh, new Insurance uh, Industry Act in the future. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. All right, thank you. Honourable Member, Honourable Minister Suri Raju, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Honourable Speaker, sir. Uh, I'd like to contribute to the, the motion before the House, but uh, I think enough has been uh, mentioned about uh, insurance uh, uh, policies. Uh, but i I just like to uh, make a quick comment, uh, Mr. Speaker, sir, on uh, the issues about community halls. Uh, I need to clarify this. Uh, government did not totally remove uh, the assistance uh, of, uh, given to our communities on, uh, on uh, community halls. But uh, government decided to uh, uh, relook at the priorities in terms of um, the implementation of such projects and, of course, ensure that it's consistent as well with the uh, the current acts that we have. Mr. Speaker, sir, uh, one, uh, let me, uh, as Minister responsible for disaster management and rural development, also uh, make this point very clear. There is a difference between community halls and evacuation centers. And government is very careful about this because I know, I know for a fact, Mr. Speaker, sir, that our community halls are also referred to as evacuation centers. But this is why government decided to review this, because when people like the, the Van Bear incident, sir, they uh, ran to the church uh, as, uh, uh, for shelter. But then the church collapsed. It's a question about standards. 
because in the Disaster Management Act of 1998, which is currently under review, there are what we call designated evacuation centers. And when uh, such facilities are referred to as designated evacuation centers, government has a responsibility to make sure that these facilities are built to standard. And unfortunately, I say that again, Mr. Speaker, unfortunately, most of our, or some of our community halls, which were referred to as evacuation centers, were not built to standard. And there is, we have a responsibility to look after our people. And their safety and well-being is our priority. And we have to ensure that whether it be evacuation centers or community halls, it must be built to standard if they are to be used for shelter when the need does arise, Mr. Speaker. And that is why the government decided to review this project. We, Mr. Speaker, sir, through the DRR uh, allocation in 2013, secured the first $2 million in which the focus was on community halls, sea walls, uh, river protection, river bank protection, and I believe that allocation is now uh, resting with the Ministry of Waterways. That was the first allocation of DRR in which we continue to provide evacuation centers to the people. Mr. Speaker, sir, government and now government has come up with a new design for what we call these purpose-built evacuation centers, and they can be referred to as community halls as well. It was not totally removed, but of course, we have to review this in terms of our priorities, Mr. Speaker, sir. Again, Again, let me say this. We must build to standard. Of course, we need to review some laws that we have. One is the building code. Mr. Speaker, sir, the building code, unfortunately, does not cover most of rural Fiji. And this, when it comes to standard in rural Fiji, is the rural local authority. We had, we had these issues in previous uh, governments, Mr. Speaker, sir, and we have continued to raise it from DRR perspective. That needs to be looked at in tandem because, unfortunately, our building code is not enforced in rural Fiji. We only have the Public Health Act. Order. Listen, you might learn something. Order. You have the Public Health Act and you have the... Order. Order. <laughs> Order. So this needs to be reviewed, Mr. Speaker, sir. <laughs> I have highlighted what Order. you need to hear. Order. <laughs> last, last speaker for, for this debate, the Honourable Attorney General. Before Thank you, Mr. Speaker, sir. Just to uh, bring it back to the uh, insurance itself, Mr. Speaker, sir. Mr. Speaker, um, the Honourable uh, Tusawao uh, talked about the bundle insurance. I'd like to highlight the fact because it's critically important for us to understand how many people are now within this particular bundle insurance scheme. We have now 200 rice farmers, 256 dairy farmers, 11,606 sugarcane farmers, 160 cane farmers, um, 35,041 civil servants, which includes people from the disciplined uh, forces also, Mr. Speaker, sir, and 72,376 social welfare recipients. Because we've also, uh, as you know, Mr. Speaker, sir, the members in this House would know that through the budgetary process, we've also been allocating premium allocations for the social welfare recipients because we don't want them to fall further into, through the cracks again. And for the first time, we, of course, have social welfare recipients now getting certain benefits. In particular, for example, there's a, there's a, there's a loss of one of the social welfare recipients. The family is able to cover various expenses. If there's a fire, if they get ill, etc., Mr. Speaker, sir. Now, it's interesting that some of the uh, organizations themselves are paying the premiums. So, for example, with the uh, Sugarcane Growers Council, are paying the premiums for sugarcane farmers. Copra Millers of Fiji, or Coconut Millers of Fiji, as we now call, uh, is, is paid, uh, pays the premium for the copra farmers. And, of course, Fiji Rice pays for the uh, premium for the, the rice farmers, Mr. Speaker, sir. Mr. Speaker, sir, uh, again, um, as has been highlighted by both sides, there needs to be efficiency within the system. And as you may, may recall, Mr. Speaker, sir, in 2017-18, we brought about a massive reform to the insurance sector. Namely, we started off with the third-party insurance scheme. 
As you know, third-party insurance was actually through insurance companies, private insurance companies. It was a very litigious process. People actually had to go to courts to make a claim, and it was what we call a fault system. So in other words, if the, if the little child ran onto the road because he got scared while standing in the middle of the road, on the side of the road, and the, the driver actually hit him or her, then there would be no payout because you, have to, you could prove fault. The insurance company would say that the pedestrian was at fault and therefore no insurance was paid out. We've removed the fault system now, Mr. Speaker, sir. You don't actually no need to go through insurance companies. There's actually a levy through the LTA system. It goes through the ACCF, the Accident Compensation Commission of Fiji, which we set up, Mr. Speaker, sir. And I'm happy to report, Mr. Speaker, sir, already $10 million has been paid out. $10 million has already been paid out. Not all of them are to do with car accidents. It also includes unemployment benefits also, Mr. Speaker, sir. Because as you know, we've removed that now also. So small, medium enterprises, micro enterprises that actually employ people, their workers are now covered under this scheme. And again, it's a no-fault clause. So for, for example, if I'm working on a machine and you know, if my finger gets chopped off, the employer, the insurance company can say, well, he was grog doped, he contributed to the negligence of his thumb being chopped off, and therefore we'll only pay X percentage as opposed to the full compensation. Again, that's gone out the window. So it's making it a lot more easier for the consumers of Fiji, in particular those at the lower end of the socioeconomic scale. We've included in that also, Mr. Speaker, sir, schoolyard injuries. And we have seen one or two claims where, for example, if you have a child maybe running around with a pencil and pokes the other child's eye, and they, lost, and they lose their eye, and it's actually happened. Now they actually get compensation for that paid through the ACCF. So some, uh, a lot of, uh, you know, sort of, change in, in, in the paradigm is actually taking place regarding insurance, the bundle insurance themselves. We have to understand, Mr. Speaker, sir, that insurance companies at the end of the day, even with the insurance companies, whether it's Sun Insurance or other insurance companies, a lot of them rely on what we call the reinsurers. All reinsurers sit offshore. They are the big boys and girls with lots of money. And they are the ones who actually set the agenda. In the same way in the 90s when we had the two or three cyclones that came, that's when they changed the requirements for getting a, slight, a cyclone engineering certification. It came from offshore. And the insurance companies then would only offer you cyclone insurance cover if you met very onerous requirements of standards for you to be able to get that level of certification and then be covered for insurance purposes. This is why many homes in Fiji, very low rate of insurance penetration has been highlighted, about 12% only, and generally tends to be those who are wealthy who can get their homes insured. We obviously need to change the paradigm. Uh, the Honorable Tusawa mentioned Picrafi and you know, the various other products being offered. It's, we're a very long way away from there. I have to tell you, as we've highlighted in Parliament before, that we're working with the World Bank. They came up with one insurance product. And that insurance product, because they need to assess the risk, because under, underwriters always want to know what kind of risk, maximum risk, they will be exposed to. So if we, uh, they said, we'll only, for example, provide insurance cover to registered farmers. So they know exactly how many registered farmers we have. And we actually rejected it because you can imagine a scenario through what we call a parametric insurance where if you say that this area has been cyclone hit and then everybody in that area will get the cover. But they said we'll only cover those people in that area who are registered farmers. So you could have a village, you could have a registered farmer there, you could have a registered farmer there. So the others aren't registered farmers, we only would have paid out to them. It would have been completely obscured, would have been completely unfair. So we rejected that particular product. So we're still working through these processes to be able to get the confidence built up. And we, of course, want to provide insurance cover for these, um, uh, for these people. Mr. Speaker, sir, the, the other point that I wanted to highlight is that the micro, small, and medium enterprise uh, definition, as we announced yesterday with the assistance we are providing, will, in particular, for small and medium enterprises, provide a concessional loan for what we call working capital. And working capital includes payments for insurance premiums. So some of them who cannot pay that will be able to use some of that funding, should they be eligible for that concessional uh, loan funding, will be able to pay the insurance premiums. There is a big issue at the moment in the tourism sector. You have, for example, the Hilton Hotel. It's completely empty, but they have to pay insurance. And I think the insurance premium, from what I understand, is about $4 million. Now, there's no revenue being generated. Where will they get the $4 million? FNPF that owns West End, Sheraton, uh, you know, Intercon and, and the other properties, Momi, uh, GPH, etc. 
they have to pay the premium for them. A lot of insurance, a lot of hotel properties are facing this issue. A lot of factories, garment factories, actually, that have some have actually reduced their hours, have been shut down because of no demand from Australia and New Zealand. They still have to pay the insurance premium. So some of the insurance companies are working with them. There's, of course, going to be a new norm that's going to be set. But at this point in time, the only certainty we have is the uncertainty. We know it's going to be uncertain times ahead. Nobody within the financial sector at the moment knows how it's all going to pan out. So to be able to, to say, let's do a law now in place, or put a law in place, is actually a bit premature, because we do not know what the new paradigm will be. But I'd like to thank the committee for the work, Mr. Speaker. So this is, of course, very challenging times. But in respect of the bundling of insurances, etc., we're looking forward to that. Uh, you know, being furthered uh, along the track, and we'd like to, of course, thank the Reserve Bank of Fiji for the regulatory oversight. Thank you. I thank the Attorney General for his contribution to the debate, and I now give the floor to the Chairperson for his right of reply. You have the floor, sir. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. Uh, I thank all the Honourable Members for the contribution. Just to add uh, on uh, the Honourable uh, Gabuka's comment, uh, very rightly picked up by Honourable Linus Saratu, uh, we had three construction of three education centres, which I just want to mention that uh, the government had in its plan. There was uh, Nerikoso village, uh, Nakoro Tumbu Ra village, Moumi village in uh, Namalata Talebu. These are the three projects which was already initiated. And this is why the government is investing a lot uh, in uh, school building, uh, Honorable Speaker say. That's why 2KDB5, which CIU often look at these projects, so that the evacuation centers are safe uh, for the information of this uh, house. With this word, I thank all honorable members. I thank the honorable chair. Parliament will now vote to note the content of the report. Does any member oppose the motion? As no member opposes, the motion is agreed to unanimously. Honorable members, on that note, we will suspend proceedings for lunch and Parliament will resume proceedings at 2.30 p.m. We adjourn for lunch. <laughs>